Hey, Chapel Street Church family, can you guess where I am? I'm here at Kane County Cougar Stadium, and that means one thing, the return of our stadium service. August 29th, all of our campuses, all of our venues coming together in one place at one time right here to worship our one good God. You won't want to miss this. We're going to have baptisms here together, worship together, celebration. You can register for you and your family at chapelstreet.church slash stadium service. You can also pre-order food for you and your family because this is going to be an event you won't want to miss. The theme for this year's stadium service is Welcome Home. And of course, we're welcoming all people back together as we launch into the fall ministry season but it's also a chance to welcome us back home to the love of Christ as we regather as his church. So don't miss August 29th right here at the Cougar Stadium for stadium service. We'll see you there. really excited to be sharing again this week from Revelation, uh, but I'm also really excited for Stadium Service. I remember the last time we did that, a couple of years ago now, uh, be praying for the weather, um, not only that it wouldn't rain, but also that it wouldn't be so hot that uh, Andrew gets a little sunburn on top of his bald head, because uh, that happened last year, and I was not happy about it. Um, we are jumping into Revelation 1 this week. Uh, we started last week, and uh, Jeff kind of framed up this whole series that we're calling Seven as uh, a way of revealing Jesus, right? Revelation, apocalypsis, which is the Greek word for revelation, means revealing. So I thought we could start this week. I want to show you some bled pictures, uh, and I want you to help me kind of reveal who they are, figure out who they are. So we've got the first one here. Just shout out, who is this? Shrek. Shrek. Well done. You guys are good. Okay, it was Shrek. Uh, Next one. Indiana Jones. You are good. You're quick. Okay, Indiana Jones. I heard they're doing another Indiana Jones. He does not look nearly as cool. I think he needs to lay his hat down, but uh, he's one more. This one is the hardest, I think. It is Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. Tom Hanks, Forrest Gump. My favorite movie. And then one last one. (laughs) Pastor Jeff. Yeah, it's Pastor Jeff. I couldn't resist putting that in there. Well, uh, I wanted to show you those because, uh, as we said, Revelation is about revealing. It's about helping us see clearly. Uh, And this book is a very misunderstood book. Uh, It's a letter that, as Jeff shared last week, most Christians kind of, we want to steer away from it because it frightens us and intimidates us. Or there's an entirely different crowd that love to get way deep into this letter for all the wrong reasons because they think it points to something uh, in the future explaining things. But this book is, uh, is so much more than either of those. It is primarily about revealing Jesus to us. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at who Revelation says Jesus is. And we're going to let its words reveal him to us. Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, it starts by saying the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. It's like it was given to one of Jesus' best friends, a guy called John. John we know well because he wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote three of the letters in the New Testament. And at the time of writing this letter, uh, we believe that he may be the only apostle left alive. It's probably somewhere around the year 90 AD. uh, And Peter and Paul were martyred somewhere in the late 60s. Uh, And so the church is looking very different than it did right at the beginning of the book of Acts, let's say. It's kind of a scary time. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of persecution. uh, There's a lot of struggle. And so Jesus wants to come and give the churches of the day his message of encouragement, of hope, of comfort and grace. But before he gets to the messages that he has for the churches specifically, he's going to have to help people see who he really is. The churches need to see who Jesus really is. Before he gives them this message, they need to see him as he is. And church, what I really believe for us as as a body of believers is that as we go through this series, we really need to see Jesus. We don't need to have a bled picture of who our God is. We don't need to have a bled picture of who our Savior is. We need to let Revelation speak to us and teach us who Jesus really is. So my challenge to you uh, over the course of these next few weeks as we go through this letter is I want you to let the images and the titles of Jesus kind of shake you up a little bit. I want you to let them challenge you and, and ask you these questions. Is this the Jesus that you believe in? Is this the Jesus that you hope in? Take the words of comfort and encouragement that we learn from Jesus, but also let it give you a clearer picture. 
I want to do it this morning by just kind of breaking down this introduction of Revelation uh, because it shows us three things. It reveals, first of all, a ruler. It reveals to us a savior. And it reveals to us a God. And the first thing that we see is a revealed ruler. A revealed ruler. Uh, Some of you uh, might remember that earlier this year, a very significant figure in England passed away, Prince Philip. We've got a picture here. Prince Philip was the queen's husband. Uh, And you may not know that he had a very official title as a member of the royal family that was 133 words long. And because I think that Americans always need a little bit of a top up on British culture, I thought I would share Prince Philip's official title with you all this morning. So strap yourselves in. Here it goes. His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Earl of Merioneth, Baron Greenwich, Royal Knight of the Most Noble Order of the Garter, Extra Knight of the Most Ancient and Most Noble Order of the Thistle, Member of the Order of Merit, Grand Master and First and Principal Knight Grand Cross of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, Knight of the Order of Australia, Additional Member of the Order of New Zealand, Extra Companion of the Queen's Service Order, Royal Chief of the Order of Logohu, which I'm pretty sure is made up, Extraordinary Companion of the Order of Canada, Extraordinary Commander of the Order of Military Merit, Lord of Her Majesty's Most Honorable Privy Council, Privy Councillor of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada, Personal Aide de Camp to Her Majesty, Lord High Admiral of the United Kingdom. Woo! That is a lot of words. Maybe he's compensating just a little bit. See, Prince Philip needs 133 words to articulate his debatable authority over a country that is a 40th the size of the United States. In the letter of Revelation, John only needs less than 20 to describe Jesus' unquestioned authority over the entire earth. This is what he says at the beginning of Revelation, verses 1 through 5. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And here's the titles. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. See, John, in the opening of this letter, as he begins writing, he wants to establish the credentials of Jesus, the one who's relaying this message to him. And he's gonna do it through these three very specific titles, faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, and ruler of the kings of the earth. And these titles are telling us something about who Jesus really is. They're telling us who it is that's speaking to us. And it's meant to confront us with a question. And here's the question. Who do you answer to? Who's your ruler? Who is your authority in this world? I want to look at these titles a little more closely. First of all, faithful witness. John calls Jesus the faithful witness. Now, this is probably a callback to some scripture in the Old Testament in the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 42, 5, this is what we read. Then they said to Jeremiah, this being the people of Israel, may the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act in accordance with everything the Lord your God sends you to tell us. See, John, for his Jewish hearers here, he wants to call back to something that they're all very familiar with. They're steeped in all of this Old Testament theology and and wording, and he wants them to understand that Jesus is the one that they're accountable to. See, back in Jeremiah, throughout all the, the turbulence, the people were saying, we want God to hold us accountable to the things that he's called us to. And John is saying, that's Jesus. He's the one that we're accountable to. You are not ultimately the witness to your own life when you stand before God. Jesus is. And that is comforting, and it's also a little bit intimidating. See, it's going to be incredibly important in Revelation because the churches we discover in Revelation have somewhat of a misunderstanding about themselves. They don't have an accurate view of themselves. And so this faithful witness, this Jesus, the authority who is the head of the church, is going to come and make himself known. And he's going to hold the churches accountable to what he's called them to. 
And this is just as much as important for us because despite living 2,000 years since this was written and since this message was given, Jesus is our faithful witness. He's the one who holds Chapel Street Church accountable ultimately. We have all kinds of checks and accountability boards here at church. Jeff answers to the executive council and an accountability board. But ultimately, the one who we all answer to as the body of Christ is Jesus. He's the one who is a faithful witness to our lives and carries us through and holds us to account. Are we being the people that he's called us to be? And this is how John begins. And then he moves on and he calls Jesus the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn from the dead. This is yet another callback to the Old Testament. It's, it's a little known fact that Revelation, out of all of the New Testament books, is the book that has the most allusions and callbacks to the Old Testament. It's a really beautiful picture of the whole story of God. But this one in particular is taken from Psalm 89. And in Psalm 89, it's written that I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So again, this is a title that John is giving Jesus to make it clear to the churches, this is the ultimate authority here. Jesus is the king. He is the one above all. But by calling him the firstborn of the dead, it's also a point to the fact that Jesus is the dividing line in history. Here's why I say that, is because the firstborn from the dead doesn't mean that Jesus was the first created being. That's something that throughout history people have wrestled with a little bit and thought, is that true? But what we believe as Christians is that Christ is eternal. The Son of God is, uh, is God incarnate, and so he was always there. So when he's called firstborn from the dead, what it means is that through his resurrection, he was the first one to enter into what he is going to give all of us, a new kingdom, new bodies, new life. And so the resurrection, the cross of Jesus, is the dividing line of history because everything following that cross, and really everything before that cross, is separated into who belongs to Jesus and who doesn't. And John is saying, do you belong to him? Do you belong to the firstborn from the dead? Are you a part of this coming kingdom? I hear a phrase, uh, probably in the last few years, this has become more popular now. Whenever we're going through a crisis, as a, a culture, as a world, I hear this phrase, we want to be on the right side of history. We want to be on the right side. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. And the idea behind it is that we want future generations to judge us as being righteous people, good people who cared for those around us, who loved those around us. We don't want to be judged by future or by history as being people who are cruel or wicked or selfish. And so we want to be on the right side of history. But I think that that's the wrong question, especially for believers. I don't think we should be asking ourselves whether we're on the right side of history because history changes from generation to generation. Every generation that comes has a new and different view on everything that went before. And we're constantly trying to figure out, did we do the right thing here? We were the right kind of people in this generation. I think it's pretty plain if you read history, we weren't. We're always discovering that we could have been better, that we were not as righteous as we should be. I think the right question we should ask ourselves is, are we on the right side of the cross? Are we on the right side of the resurrection? Are we right side of the firstborn of the dead? The one who holds us accountable. Because it's not going to be future generations or history that judges ultimately. It's going to be Jesus. He's going to hold us accountable to being the kind of people that he called us to be. And the third title that uh, John gives Jesus in this opening statement is another statement about authority. He calls him the ruler of the kings of the earth ruler of the kings of the earth. See, John wants to really drive home with three titles in no uncertain terms that there is no authority above Jesus. There's no one higher than him. No king, no prime minister, no judge, no leader. What's really biting about this one is at the time that John was writing this, the Roman emperor who was persecuting the church, he would often say that he was the ruler of the kings of the earth. It's kind of stealing and borrowing a title there to be like, no, you're not. Jesus is. And it's a really great message to the church who live under this Roman emperor who is he's pushing on them and persecuting them and saying, if you would just bend the knee, if you would just compromise who you are, the way that you see this world, the way that you see authority, if you would bend the knee to Caesar, it'll all be easier for you. And what John is saying is you can't do that. You can't compromise who you are. You can't change what Jesus has laid out for you because he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. You don't answer to Caesar, you answer to Jesus. That's why John calls himself a witness. When he starts this, he says in verse two, John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
because everybody who's ever lived sits under the authority, not of Caesar or a prime minister or a king, but under Jesus. So who do you answer to in this world? Who is it that's shaping the standard for the way you live your life? It should be Jesus. But do we live like that? Even as I'm sharing this with you right now, I know I can't say that I do. More often than not, I'm my own authority. I decide what my life should look like, what things I should pursue, how I should react to other people. Lord, forgive me that I have not lived like Jesus is my faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, or the ruler of the kings of the earth. And that's why I don't just need a revealed ruler, I need a revealed savior. I need a revealed savior. So that's the second thing that John tells us about, a revealed savior. Now, I've had a lot of different titles myself over the course of my life, obviously Andrew, my name. Uh, but when I moved to America, I didn't think Andrew was quite American enough, so I tried to change it up to AJ. It did not take off, unfortunately. But if you want to call me AJ, I would be very happy. I've almost got the uh, next-gen ministries at church to start calling me AJ. Um, I, sometimes I get called the British guy, right? That one hasn't gone away. I get called the bald guy, which I'm fine with. I've got a pretty spherical head, so it's not too bad. Uh, I, of course, get called the comic book nerd or the Star Wars nerd. Again, those are badges of honor for me. Uh, but the title that I've picked up recently that I'm a little embarrassed about, uh, I was doing one of our For Where You Are podcasts with Jeff and Pastor Joe. And uh, if you haven't listened to our podcast, there's always a section of the podcast where Pastor Joe uh, has his What Joe Wants to Know section. And he asks us kind of a goofy question, what's your favorite movie? This week it was, strangely, if you could defeat one animal in hand-to-hand -hand combat, what would it be? And I foolishly declared that I could beat a coyote one-on-one. -on -one. Which, let's be honest, coyotes are kind of mangy looking dogs. I'm not saying I can take a pack, but if it's one coyote in my backyard, I've got it. I can do it. And so I have now become known by Pastor Joe as the one coyote man. Uh, which I will, I will take, it's a sense of accomplishment for me. But these titles that John is gonna to give to Jesus, it's not just about who he is and his authority, it's about his accomplishments. In this next little section, he's gonna tell us about Jesus' accomplishments, and it doesn't just define who Jesus is for us, it defines who we are in light of who he is. It redefines us. This is what he says starting in verse five. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So John's painting this clear picture of Jesus as he's getting rid of the blariness. He wants us to not only see Jesus' authority, but what he's achieved for us. Now remember again where the church is, where when this was being written, it kind of explains why he goes here. The church was under immense pressure and suffering and persecution. It's a really hard time. Maybe the hardest time in history to be a Christian. People are being arrested and martyred. They're losing significant leaders. And so in the midst of this, John's word ended up becoming something that we call a doxology. What that means is that the, the early church would sing these verses, five and six from Revelation, to remind themselves of who Jesus is. Is they saw brothers and sisters lost or martyred. As they faced suffering, they would sing to him who loves us who freed us, who made us. So these titles of Christ, they're not just about who Jesus is, it's about who we are in light of Jesus. Where do you find your identity? What's the most valuable title in your life? Do you see yourself through the light of who Christ is and what he's done for you as a believer? Or do you find yourself defining yourself by something else, some other achievement. See, Jesus has redefined those who belong to him as one whom he loves, frees, and repurposes. Do you see first that he loves you? To him who loves us. See, Revelation, strangely, is actually a letter primarily about the love of God. It's got all kinds of scary images in there and, and confusing images, but it's primarily a letter about the love of God. And start of this section, verse three, we're told that there is blessing for the one who reads it, hears it, and does what it says. We're told in the start of verse four, by John, that there is grace and peace to us from God. And then in verse five, we're told that he loves us. 
Three verses again and again has told us this is about God's grace to you, his peace to you, his blessing to you, his love for you. And notice it doesn't say it's to him who loves us because we have been faithful. To him who loves us because we believed rightly. To him who loves us because we have adequately repented of our sin. Before he gets to any of that, he says to him who loves us. In fact, we'll find out soon that many of the churches of Revelation were not faithful. They were off course. There was corrections that Jesus had to give them. Yet John is reminding them right here, despite that, this is about the one who loves you. Jesus loves you not because you're lovable, but because he is loving. Jesus loves you not because you were faithful, but because he is faithful. It's who he is. And no matter where you are in your walk of faith this morning, no matter where you are on this question of how you define yourself, I want you to understand that Jesus loves you. It's a cliche statement, but he loves you and has freed you from your sins by his blood. It's the second thing. He doesn't just love you, he died for you, to free you, to save you. When we come before God as our great authority and this faithful witness and revealed ruler, it can be a little intimidating. It might actually crush us if we look at all the mistakes we've made and and realize we have to answer to him, answer to this Jesus, unless you realize that he's your savior, that he's freed you from your sin. Now, I am always the most insecure guy in the room, no matter which room it is, always. And when I hear this phrase, Jesus loves you, even as a pastor, I hear that again and again, and sometimes I question it. I think, well, maybe he loves me, but he doesn't really like me because of that, because of this stuff that I did here, this mistake that I did here, the way that I talked to my wife, the way that I talked to my kids, the way that I talked to my colleagues, this mistake, this bad choice, this error in judgment, Jesus can't really love me. And I doubt it, I struggle. I think Jesus can't love me because he can see this, whatever this is. But the truth is, he can't see that. Whatever that is for you, I'm telling you, he can't see it because he's freed you from it by his blood. If you are in Christ, if you have trusted in Christ, it's not just that Jesus has forgiven you, he's erased it. He doesn't see it anymore. He has turned his face away from it, we're told in scripture. He doesn't see your mistakes and your brokenness and your failings because he's freed you from them. You are no longer what you have done. You are what Jesus has done. That's why these titles are so important to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. So if you have trust in Christ, you're not only loved, you're not only free and forgiven, you are remade into something entirely brand new. You have been repurposed for the most significant role that a human being can have in this life. And this is how Jesus' good friend Peter puts it in his letters that we've just finished reading. It says in 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So this is what human beings were made for. You and I, we weren't made for glorifying our own name. We were made for lifting up the name of Jesus in everything, in our professions, in our marriages, in our parenting, in our friendships. That's who he has made us, a kingdom of priests, royalty. You know that by calling us a kingdom and and royal priests, what he's saying is that it's not just that Jesus is king in authority, it's that he has asked us and invited us to come and rule alongside him, to be with him. And the most important thing that we can learn from this is that all of our lives in this room, no matter who you are and what your skill set is, you can have an eternal impact on the lives around you because you are a royal priest, because Jesus has remade you, because he has purposed you to be an agent of his grace, his mercy, and his love. And to the extent that we pursue that, that's how we will make an impact right where we are. The last way that Jesus is revealed to us in this passage is as God incarnate, God himself. He's our revealed God. This is what he says in Verses seven and eight, behold, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail 
on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. These are the grandest titles that Jesus has given in Revelation 1. Alpha and Omega. The one who is, was, and is to come, Almighty. John's point is simple. Jesus is not just one religious figure among many. He's not just a king. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a priest. He's God. He's what our good friend C.S. Lewis famously said of Jesus. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any kind of patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. That is good news, and let me tell you why. Because if Jesus is God, and we are clear that he is God, then you have got an unshakable place to put your hope. You have got an unshakable place to put your hope. So, what do we hope in? What do we hope in as a people? First thing that John says about Jesus that helps us see that he's God is he says, behold, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. And again, if you were Jewish and you were reading this, you knew exactly what it means. It's an allusion to the Old Testament again. It was a description of the Messiah in the book of Daniel. It was something that Jesus himself actually quoted about himself. It's one of the reasons we know that Jesus himself believed he was God because at his trial at the crucifixion, the high priest says to Jesus, Are you the son of God? Do you really think that you're the son of God? And Jesus says, you have said so. But I tell you from now on, you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And when Jesus says this at his trial, the high priest rips his robes and screams blasphemy because he knows exactly what Jesus has just said. Jesus has said, I'm God. I'm the God of your ancestors. I'm the one that you have worshiped for thousands of years. Here I am. And the crowd start beating him and spitting on him because they think that his claim to be God is so outrageous, so offensive, so insulting and insane that they crucify him. They pierce him. You know what the most powerful part of this passage is? Is that when John tells us that it'll come on the clouds of heaven, it says every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Even those very men who at that trial had Jesus say this and crucified him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. John's point is that those very same men who didn't see Jesus when he was right there in front of him, one day they're going to see. You know, when Jesus entered Jerusalem on the way to the cross, he stood over the city and he wept. And he said something really interesting. He said, oh, if you would know the day of your visitation. Jesus said, if you would only know that here I am, right now, in the midst of you. And he wept. What John is saying is really tragic because one day, there will be those who weep because they didn't see Jesus when he was here. When he's amongst us right now, at work in us. Jesus wants the churches of Revelation to know, I am here amongst you. And so that's why John continues and he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, quoting Jesus as he comes on the clouds. The Lord God who is and was and is to come. Now, some of you may know that Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And this was kind of a common way of describing God. It happened in the Old Testament with the letters of the Hebrew alphabet as well, saying that God is the first and the last. And the point is not simply to say he's the first and the last, but that he covers everything in between. So being the Alpha and the Omega, that means that he is the first, he is the last, and he is all of it in between. He's timeless. He's the one who started history. He's the one who will finish history. See, John is trying to reframe how we see our lives in light of who Jesus is. How do you think about the time span of your life in light of who Jesus is? And he says he's the one who is, was, and is to come. And did you notice that that's a strange way to write it because it's out of order. He doesn't say was, is, is to come. He says is now, was, is to come. And it's because the churches of Revelation needed to know that Jesus is not coming for them one day. He wasn't with them at one point, but now he's left. He is right now in the midst of them. And Shovel Street Church, today, right now, the risen Jesus is in our midst by the Holy Spirit. He is the one who is. 
Nothing that is currently happening in this world is outside of his control. No pandemic, no war, no election, no school board policy, no financial crisis, no debilitating illness is outside of his power and control. He's the almighty. He's present and at work in all of them. And just like the churches of Revelation, we can't see the chaos and crisis around us as a reason for God's absence. We need to see that he is present here in the midst of all of these things with us. It's an opportunity for the church to shine to reveal the God who is, was, and is to come. I believe that in every generation, in all the struggles that we face and the questions and the doubts, they are opportunities for the church to be a bright shining light in this world of who Jesus really is. I wanna close with this story that I think kind of captures what I just said. Some of you, uh, if you're fans of America's Got Talent, you might have seen recently there was a girl on the show called Jane Machesky. Jane uh, goes by the stage name Nightbird, and she sang a song called It's Okay. And the notoriously mean Simon Cowell hit the golden buzzer straight away, tears in his eyes, sent her straight to the live shows. Now what you might not know about Jane is that she's a Christian. She's also facing cancer for the third time in her life that has spread to her liver, her spine, and her lungs. She does not have much time left. Yet this is Jane's own words from her blog. She says, when it comes to pain, God isn't often in the business of taking it away. Instead, he adds to it. Now I'm really interested in what she's about to say. He's more of a giver than a taker. He doesn't take away my darkness, he adds light. He doesn't spare me of thirst, he brings me water. He doesn't cure my loneliness, he comes near to me. So why do we believe that when we are in pain, it must mean that God is far? See, in her pain, Jane has hope. Why? How can she say those things that she said? She knows who Jesus is. She knows the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is with her right now, who holds her. She goes on to say, I'm still reeling, drenched in sorrow. I'm still begging, bargaining, demanding, and disappearing. And I guess that means I have all the more reason to say thank you because God is drawing near to me. He is here again and again and again. Jane preached it better than I ever could to you this morning. This is why it matters that we see who Jesus is. This is why we need to have a clear picture of him. Because it can take a frail, dying, suffering woman and fill her with joy and hope. There's nothing else in this world that can do that. Because when we see him, just as Jane saw him, in his power, in his love, in his grace, his mercy, in his presence in all of our trials and sufferings and struggles, and we see the God who is on his throne in Revelation, then our trials and our sufferings, they can never rob us of our joy. They'll never be able to convince us that our God is not good. Because we'll always have him. So we'll close this morning by just saying this. The most important truth that you could ever learn is the true identity of Jesus. And the most comforting truth that you could ever learn is the true identity of Jesus. So let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you for the words of John in Revelation. I thank you for the song that he sings to him who loves us and has freed us by his blood and has made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, the Alpha, the Omega, the one who is, was, and is to come. Father, today we gather as your people and we celebrate that Jesus, that clear picture of the one who is on his throne, who loves us and has freed us. It's in his name that we worship this morning. Amen.